as an unknown medical student. But now we know that his name was Steve Perry, here seen a couple of years after he made his now famous remark, which stimulated Ridley to research an artificial intraocular lens. There were three problems for Harold Ridley to solve. First, to use a transparent material that the eye would tolerate. Second, to determine the size, shape, and refractive power of the lens. And third, to find whereabouts to insert it and retain it securely in the eye. Ridley considered using glass, but remembering the lack of inflammation in the eyes of airmen wounded by perspex, he was inspired in choosing the same polymer, polymethylmethacrylate, or PMMA. It was easy to work and supplied by ICI, who later renamed it Perspex CQ, standing for clinical quality, and it became the gold standard of implant materials. The lens design was taken over by John Pike, an optical scientist at Rainers Limited. This company made all Ridley's lenses and is still in production today. The original 1948 design shows the circumferential groove by which the introducing forceps gripped the lens. But Pike and Ridley had copied too closely the radii of curvature of the human lens, and the lens power was too great, so the first two patients became highly myopic. Also, the lens was very heavy, weighing 112 milligrams in air compared with approximately 5 milligrams for a modern implant. They used cetramide originally for sterilization, but it was absorbed by the lens and later leached out and caused iridocyclitis, which was wrongly attributed to the PMMA itself. Later, the implant was sterilized in an ampule of sodium hydroxide, which had to be neutralized with sodium bicarbonate before insertion. On the 29th of November 1949, he carried out a planned extracapsular cataract extraction for a 45-year-old female and inserted the implant. But because he was uncertain about its stability, he removed it and closed the eye. Three months later, on the 8th of February 1950, he replaced the implant in the ciliary sulcus as a secondary procedure. Because he did not suture this graphy knife section, an iris prolapse occurred three days later, requiring repositioning. The final vision was 6 over 18, but with a correction of minus 18 diopters and a 6 diopter cylinder. These operations were carried out in secrecy. David Spalton has rescued the theatre record book wherein the theatre sister, Doreen Ogg, wrote the lens implantation operation as a lenticular graft in order to disguise it. Daphne Fellows was a very young nurse when she worked in the operating theatre at St Thomas's Hospital in 1952 with Sir Harold Ridley when, by then, he had done four or five cases. This is the original operation book from the hospital at that time, and this is the first time Mrs. Fellows has seen this book for over half a century. Did Mr. Ridley ever realize that the legacy of his work was going to become universally accepted? No, I'm, I'm sure he didn't at this time, not when I was in the theater. Did you and your theatre colleagues realise what his efforts would provide for cataract patients? No, I don't think we did fully um, realise, although I think um, a, as a nurse, um, when one took the, the, the double pads that the patients had on off and the thrill of seeing the, of the patient kind and seeing, saying that they could see, um, one did realise that you know, a miracle really had always been wrought. Ridley's team had hoped to maintain this secrecy for two years until effective results could be shown from what was the insertion of an intraocular foreign body. No animal work was done as Ridley maintained that the tolerance of PMMA in the human eye had been shown from wounds received in aerial combat. No optical laboratory bench work was done and no financial gain was sought. Indeed, Rainers charged only about one pound for each lens. St. Thomas's Hospital was chosen for the first case, as security could be better guaranteed there, although the second, third and fourth cases were done at Moorfields. To be first 
Ridley published his procedure in what he considered was an obscure medical journal, the St. Thomas's Hospital Report, when it was suggested that others might report it before he did. Archive footage shows Ridley doing his fifth case in 1951. Other surgeons did indeed try the procedure, but with increasing complications. The implant dislocated easily, forwards into the anterior chamber, backwards into the vitreous, or sideways out of the pupil, causing iritis and glaucoma. To place the heavy Ridley lens into the ciliary sulcus without damaging the zonule or the lens capsule before the operating microscope was invented must have been very demanding. It is extraordinary that bearing in mind what happened to Casa Amata's patient in Dresden, Ridley implanted 10 lenses after intracapsular cataract extractions, and at least two of them were reported as dislocating into the vitreous cavity. But Ridley didn't tell Sir Stuart Duke Elder what he was doing, and for that he was never forgiven. Sir Stuart Duke Elder was then Director of Research at the Institute of Ophthalmology and Moorfields and wielded immense power and influence throughout the ophthalmic world. Duke Elder denied Ridley any support and indeed warned Ridley's assistant, Peter Choice, against collaborating with him because it would jeopardize his career. Ridley's first case presentation was to the Oxford Ophthalmological Congress in July 1951 and it was for him a savage disappointment. His colleagues walked out, and Sir Stuart Duke Elder refused even to look at two patients Ridley had brought with him, one of whom had 6 over 6 uncorrected vision. In the United States, Dr. Warren Rees, a few days after Ridley had first described his operation there, became the first American surgeon to implant a Ridley lens, which he did in March 1952 at Will's Eye Hospital. This must have seemed encouraging. However, when Ridley addressed the American Academy of Ophthalmology seven months later, he had his paper openly repudiated by Dr. Derek Vale, sometime president of the Academy. And worse still, two years later, the Academy deemed his operation to be not sufficiently proven for use in the United States. In 1964, Ridley finally abandoned this operation after incurring 20% long-term failures. Although he had solved two of the three problems, the last remaining was secure stabilization. How did he cope with the bitter criticism from his colleagues? I wouldn't think very well. I think he found it very difficult. Because? So. I think because he was such a quiet, ret retired, shy man um, who kept everything to himself and, and didn't really, um, I mean that, this is obviously my impression as a very junior nurse, um, but I would think he found it very difficult to, dis to talk to his colleagues about any problems he had. But three surgeons still pursued the concept because it was so attractive. They were Choice in England, Binkhorst in the Netherlands, and in South Africa, Edward Epstein. Well, where else in the eye could the implant be fixed? The idea of supporting haptics in the anterior chamber angle led to the first generation of anterior chamber lenses. The Strampelli rigid implant was widely used, but it was heavy and hard to fixate, and it caused damage to Decimae's membrane leading to bullous keratopathy. In Germany, the Danheim lens had flexible nylon loop haptics, but this also met with instability, glaucoma, and corneal decompensation. So, to lessen the pressure of these loops against the peripheral cornea and angle, Joachim Barraker in Barcelona cut one arm of each Danheim loop. Although at the time this proved useless, the resulting J-shaped loops were to provide a blueprint for an excellent American implant, but not until some 25 years later. External sutures were tried by Strampelli and Choice using nylon, and by Fedorov in Russia using fibers from the patient's own Achilles tendon, all unsuccessfully. <laughs> 
Now, an ophthalmological volcano was about to erupt in Spain, where, by 1970, Professor Joachim Barraker had had to explant half of the 500 anterior chamber lenses he had used, mainly due to corneal decompensation. Barraker, whose father we saw operating in 1917, was a most excellent surgeon, and interestingly, even in the 60s, had experimented with lenses in phacic eyes. But results like these led to all two dozen or so anterior chamber designs being abandoned. And because so many reputable surgeons were involved, world opinion swung against implant surgery, and this bias persisted for many, many years. These lenses were all abandoned with the exception of the work of Peter Choice, who developed and altered his anterior chamber lens design nine times in 23 years, initially at a price for 8% of the Mark I series of implanted eyes were enucleated. Where the anterior chamber had failed, could the iris support an implant? In 1953, Edward Epstein designed the collar stud shaped lens, the waist of which was gripped by the pupil. But this was heavy and unstable, and he replaced it with a Maltese cross model, which had two loops in front of the iris and two behind. In the United States, the Epstein lens was further modified in 1968 into the Copeland lens, with at first solid flanges, and later the flanges were fenestrated, as seen here in this unused Copeland lens. 30,000 Copeland lenses were used, but they became associated with chronic uveitis. Edward Epstein, although retired, was still working on foldable hydrogel lenses in 2004. Cornelius Binkhorst was one of the great lens pioneers and died only 10 years ago. He introduced the iris clip and the iridocapsular supported lenses in 1958 at the very time when lens implantation was in great jeopardy. The iris clip lens was so called not because it clipped onto the iris, but because it resembled a paper clip. Initially, it had four nylon loops, two anterior and two posterior to the iris. This gave way to two posterior loops only, because Binkhorst found that two loops provided secure fixation with extracapsular surgery. This was fortunate because it now became apparent, as any fisherman will tell you, that nylon absorbs water and degrades. Graphically illustrating this are two nylon loops of the same age, one unused and the other explanted from an eye. Binghorst had also experimented with loops made of platinum iridium, but found it too heavy. The consequences of nylon degradation causing lens displacement were tragic but especially so when the patients were children. Many surgeons made changes to the basic Binkhorst lens. Some of them were probably unnecessary. Fedorov moved the anterior loops 90 degrees, and Jim Little from Oklahoma and Eric Arnott gained greater safety for their lens by making the loops from polypropylene, or proline, and placing the optic behind the iris. I used more than a hundred Arnott Little iridocapsular lenses. They required myotics initially to achieve stability, but still risk dislocation if the pupil dilated, as in this patient with the Uritz Zavalier syndrome. Fundoscopy and refraction were difficult, and of course a posterior capsulotomy before the YAG laser necessitated surgery, and occasionally cheese wiring of the iris occurred. Over-enthusiastic further to increase stability, Fedorov added three proline antennas to create the Sputnik Binkhorst lens. And somehow, Severin in California found room to add a fifth loop. Some surgeons sutured the loops through an iridectomy. And even Binkhorst suggested in 1973 a strut to clip onto the upper loop through the iridectomy. The Dutch ophthalmologist, Dr. Jan Wurst, who you will remember advocated lens relocation for third world cataract patients, proposed in 1969 suturing a Binkhorst two-loop lens to the iris and called it the medallion lens. This was the most popular lens used in the United States in 1975. But unfortunately, initially, 
he used nylon loops. So, looking for better fixation, he designed the last of the iris-supported lenses, the lobster claw. Well, it is patently not a lobster, so it was renamed the iris claw. This clipped gently onto the iris with two claws, or sometimes one claw, and sometimes with a 10-0 stainless steel suture as well.